Welcome to part two of our four-part mini-series on hypothesis testing. In our last video, we talked about forming statistical hypotheses, the null hypothesis, which states that there's no effect, and the alternative hypothesis, which states that there is an effect. In this video, we're going to focus our attention on establishing a standard of evidence, essentially determining what we would need to find in our study in order to be convinced that there's actually an effect or not. So let's go back to our experiment to illustrate uh, where we're headed next year. So just to remind you, we were looking at this supplement of neuro IQ and basically testing this question of whether neuro IQ is actually effective in changing people's IQ scores. And to investigate this question, we collected a sample of 15 people. We gave them neuro IQ for 30 days. We measured their IQ, and their scores can be found here. And our sample mean IQ of these people who took neuro IQ for 30 days was 105.9. And this is certainly different than the population average IQ score of 100, but the question is, is it different enough for us to be convinced that neuro IQ actually changes IQ scores? On the basis of these results, would you go out and buy neuro IQ because you think it helps your IQ, or would you not? And this is the question of establishing a standard of evidence. Remember that whenever we're doing a study, a scientific study, we're always testing against the null hypothesis here. We're always testing against the idea that there's no effect. So either we, get ready for some jargon here, reject the null hypothesis, think about what that means, we reject the idea that there's no effect, which is to say there is an effect, or we fail to reject the null hypothesis. We're failing to reject the idea that there is no effect, meaning we believe there is no effect. It's a little bit annoying that we have that much jargon and sort of like a double and triple negative here, but that's the state of the field and that's what we have to work with. So if we're testing against this null hypothesis, we need to determine how extreme of a result we would need to find, again, in order for us to be convinced that we're looking at a real effect. So in this case, how far of a result from 100, the population av average IQ, would we need to observe in our sample uh, of people who took neural IQ for 30 days in order for us to reasonably reject the null hypothesis, in order for us to reasonably say, we think there is a real effect. So in some cases, this is really clear cut. If, for example, you did this study and you found you know, an average IQ of 150 after taking neuro IQ, well, that's pretty darn good evidence that neuro IQ is changing people's IQ scores. It's very unlikely in this case that you just happen to collect a sample of 15 people who had an average IQ of 150. That would be absurd and very unlikely. And so it's much more likely to say, maybe neuro IQ is actually effective. You can also observe a result in the opposite direction. You can give people neuro IQ for 30 days and find that it really decreased their IQ scores by a significant amount, all the way down to 60. Uh, so in these cases, the decision would be very easy. But in other cases, the decision would be very difficult. What if you found an average IQ in your sample, after giving people neuro IQ for 30 days, of 109 or 92? These are pretty close to 100, as is our sample of 105.9, and here the decision becomes, again, very difficult. We don't really know. We need to establish a standard of evidence to say ahead of time, okay, if I observe this result, I'm convinced. Anything below that, anything less extreme than that, I am not convinced, and that's what we're going to learn how to do. So just to illustrate this, here's the distribution of IQ scores in the population. It looks something like this. It's normally distributed, so it has this nice bell, uh, bell curve shape. It has a mean of 100. This is the population mean mu, and a standard deviation, of course, of 15, and so on. Okay, We've learned a little bit about that in the past. So think about, you know, if we're doing this study, and we collect a sample of 15 people and the whole thing, this region of this distribution here, let me make that a little bit better. This region of this distribution here contains many very likely outcomes, right? I can easily collect a sample of 15 people, and it's not abnormal at all for me to find people with IQs around here or here or here or here or here. You can see that most people are contained in this region. And in fact, we already know that within one standard deviation in either side of the mean contains 68% of people. Within two, 95 and within 3, 99.7, then we're getting into extreme stuff, but here this is all very likely. So this region here, high probability if the null is true. Around here though, a very low probability if the null is true. Let me explain that. The null being true means there's actually no effect. So if NeuroIQ is totally ineffective, there's a very low probability of finding a group of 15 people who just naturally have an average IQ of 140, for example or an average IQ of something like 65. 
these are very unlikely. And so if we did this study and we collected the sample of 15 people, we gave them neural IQ for 30 days, and we found that their average IQ at the end of that 30-day period was 140, that's so unlikely if the null is true. That's so unlikely if neural IQ is totally ineffective that it becomes much more likely to say, well, maybe neural IQ is actually effective. And this is how our standard of evidence is going to work. Uh, the standard of evidence we call our alpha level. It's uh, alpha like this, but it's not Cronbach's alpha. Be careful. It's, uh, again, as we often have in statistics, two different ways of referring to the same thing. And here's the definition for an alpha level. It's a bit of a jargony definition, but I really encourage you to take a moment to think about what it means. Alpha is a probability or a proportion, and it's used to define which sample outcomes are considered very unlikely if the null is true, just like what we were looking at on the last slide. So the typical alpha level that we use in research and in science across pretty much every field is an alpha level of 0.05. So remember, this is a proportion or a probability, so a 0.05 translates to 5%. And here's how you can kind of interpret this value of 5%. This means that we will accept the least likely 5% of samples, the most extreme 5% possible outcomes we could find, as good enough evidence to reject the null, as good enough evidence to say that there's actually a real effect in the world. So let me illustrate that visually. So coming back to this graph here, our alpha level of 0.05 is going to determine where those cutoffs are of exactly what's really unlikely under the null and what's very likely under the null. And how it's going to do that, it's, it's going to take that 5% that we have and it's going to split it up between the very low end, 2.5% possible outcomes here, and the high end, 2.5% very uh, of, of, of possible outcomes, excuse me, here. So what this means is that if we find a value of like 140, 150, 145, this is, again, very unlikely under the null because it's within this boundary. Similarly, if we find 60, 55, 50, again, very unlikely under the null. It's extreme enough according to our alpha level of 0.05. Now notice we could change this. We could say an alpha level of 0.01 as our uh, standard of evidence here. That would make the tails more extreme. It would be something like this and this. Then we're looking at only the 1% most extreme. So here we'd be doing 0.05 or whatever <laughs> percent. I should say 0.5% uh, on one side here and 0.5% on the other. So again, that would be more strict. We would need to find a more extreme result, but it's under our control. Typically, though, we're just going to stick with this alpha level of 0.05. Now, the critical region is the last definition I'm going to give you today. The critical region is the region that contains the sample outcomes that are considered very unlikely if there's actually no effect, if the null hypothesis is true. Notice some similarities between this definition here and the definition for uh, your alpha level, and that's for good reason. It's because the critical region is determined by your alpha level. So we already saw these boundaries here, which are determined by alpha. Anything beyond those boundaries are considered your critical regions. So in this case, we have two because we're looking at increases and also decreases. This is beyond the scope of what we're going to focus on here, but you could also have a one-tailed test where you're just focusing on one side of the equation and forgetting about the other, but we're not going to worry about that. So here's how all of this works. Again, conceptually kind of challenging stuff, sort of abstract, but here's the punchline. Here's the final thing you need to really uh, know in order to bring this together. If you get a test statistic, which we're going to talk about in the next video, something like a z-test or a t-test, these all yield test statistics. If you find a test statistic that's extreme enough to be in the critical region, you can reasonably reject the null hypothesis. You can reasonably say you have evidence for an effect. So that's establishing our standard of evidence, our alpha level here. In our next video, we're going to talk about actually doing the stats, collecting some data, and doing your test statistics.